$500,000. The art world, where paintings change hands for fortunes. Selling at $95 million. But for every known masterpiece, there may be another still waiting to be discovered. Well, that's it. Well, that's it, isn't it? That <laughs> is it. That is our painting. International art dealer Philip Mould and I have teamed up to hunt for lost works by great artists. We use old-fashioned detective work and state-of-the-art science to get to the truth. Science can enable us to see beyond the human eye. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. <laughs> the problem is, not every painting is quite what it seems. I paid about £100,000 for it. That is a lot if it's a fake. It's a journey that can end in joy. Oh, isn't that great? That's so wonderful. Or bitter disappointment. They are declaring that your painting be seized and then destroyed. In this investigation, we're faced with a double mystery, an intriguing whodunit. A small church is home to the largest painting we've ever looked into on fake or fortune. It does look rather good on the stone. It looks yeah. as though it sort of belongs here, really. But who painted it? And how did what could be a 16th century old master find its way to the heart of the Lancashire countryside? In this episode, we unearth some family secrets. Miles North gives the enormous sum of 100 guineas a year in annuity. So why is he giving these people this money? The trail takes us to Italy and glorious Venice. It's like a glow. And it's to do with the water, it's to do with the architecture, it's to do with the light. Where we uncover a secret history of stolen paintings. Good God, it's a mammoth task, isn't it? Could an ambitious restoration project hold the key to solving the mystery of who painted the picture? OK, you ready? Ta-da! Oh, wow! We're heading north to the village of Tunstall in Lancashire to answer a call from a fake or fortune viewer who's contacted us with a rather intriguing puzzle. Well, this is off the beaten track. I've not been to this part of the countryside before. No, we're in the heart of Lancashire near the Lake District, but I think this is the first time that we've ever checked out the mystery in a church. Let me read you the email we received from Jane Churchwarden. It says, hello. I've attached a photo of this picture which seems to be baffling many people, me included. It has been hanging in St John the Baptist Church, Tunstall, Lancashire, for about 200 years. The estimates on its value vary widely. Can you help us? I mean, does she give us no more clues than that? Who it might have been painted by? Where it's from? Nothing. St John the Baptist Church in Tunstall is well known not only for its picturesque scenery, but also for some famous members of its congregation. Do you know, we're in Bronte country, the heart of Bronte country. This is where the Bronte sisters grew up. And they used to worship at this church, at St John the Baptist. And it's even mentioned it in one of my favourite novels, Jane Eyre, except that Charlotte Bronte renamed it Brocklehurst Church. So there's something you didn't know. It's a joy to work with someone so well read, Fiona. Church Warden Jane Greenhouse is waiting to meet us, along with the vicar, Mark Cannon, to show us the mystery painting. Aha. Gosh, it's much dirtier than I was expecting. <laughs> it's it so dark, isn't it? Despite the dirt, the first thing that emerges is the subject. It depicts one of the most emotionally charged moments in the New Testament, the aftermath of the crucifixion. I have to say, just standing here, I'm absolutely bewitched by I that figure in the bottom right-hand corner. Yes. The, the, the woman. Yes, yeah. absolutely. <clears throat> I mean, that beautiful, sort of shadowy, yeah. foreshortening of the head. And it's been here for about 200 years, yes. you said in your yes. email. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. And but do you know how, how it got here? Well, we think it was brought back by a soldier called Richard Tillman North, who was from a local family. He was also a patron of the church, and uh, we believe that while he was away at war, he might well have found this picture and brought it back and donated it, along with other things, to the church. And it was originally, we think, in the chapel of Thurland Castle, 
and I think it was 1860. Which is what, a next door castle? Just down the road, lots of castles. And when you say you think it was in there, is there evidence that it was in there? No, we're still trying to find out. This soldier yes. gave this painting to the church. You're saying he gave other things to the church as well he at did. the same time? Yes, because so he was patron of the church. Like what? The stained the glass. The and the stained glass yeah. over the altar. We need to start researching this, don't we, Joe? Well, do you want to get up a ladder then and have a look at it? And if this soldier gave other things to the church, mm -hmm. why not have a look at that and yes. see if there are any clues yeah. in that? Because yeah. that strikes mm -hmm. me as another way forward as well. Okay. Okay. Armed with my trusty torch, I'm going to take a closer look. Can I pick up any clues as to whether this is an original early painting or just some later copy? I think already there's one potentially very exciting revelation. We found a pentiment up there. Now, a pentiment coming from the Italian pentimente means a change of mind. The artist working out an idea, abandoning it, and then going on with another one. And what I've just seen up there is that Christ's loincloth, the creases were going in a different direction. In other words, the artist is working out the composition, where to go next. That suggests to me it's not a copy. While Philip gets better acquainted with the painting, I want to investigate Jane's theory about this Richard Toulmin North. I take a peek around this ancient church to see if there are any clues. Jane mentioned Richard Toulmin North, and he donated this window to the church. That we know for a fact. And there's an inscription underneath in a language I don't recognize. There are all sorts of indications of Richard Toulmin North's presence around this church. He was clearly a very important benefactor. And it's thought that he brought the painting here, but that's just supposition. But at the moment, Richard Toulmin North is the best lead we've got. If he was a soldier, then I think the best place to start is to check his military records. Meanwhile, the picture's beginning to yield a little more information. Even though the picture's extremely dirty, I've been able to get a feel for the colours beneath. And combined with that is the, is the style of the composition, the characteristics on the faces. It all suggests to me that this is Italian, a, a late Renaissance period painting. If Philip's right, then the painting could be worth tens or even hundreds of thousands. That could pose a dilemma which many churches face. How do they keep their doors open to all and safeguard their most prized assets? But to confirm my theory, I need to prove that the picture is a 16th century Italian painting, that it passes muster as a genuine old master. To help us in our investigation, we're heading to the National Gallery in London to see if we can spot any similarities between the greats of the Italian Renaissance and our humble painting. Uh, this is one of the trophy rooms in the National Gallery for Italian art. And it's got all the greats, you know, people like Michelangelo, people like Raphael, people like Titian. It's a slightly frustrating term, isn't it, old master? Because it means different things to different people. Yeah, I mean, to me, it means at least 300 years old, possibly more. It means probably continental rather than English. And it also means the painting is by a definably good hand, either an artist whose name we know or someone of real quality. It's incredible to think, isn't it, that the painting we saw in that little church in Tunstall in the middle of the countryside could, just could, belong somewhere like this. Uh, it's stiff company, but it's not impossible. There's one painting here that might bring us closer to understanding our picture. I feel there's all sorts of crossovers with ours. It's by Paolo Veronese, painted in the 1570s. And the first thing you noticed, thinking about our painting, is just this theatrical arrangement of figures, the way they almost sort of tumble over each other. It's the king's um, anointing the Christ child. And that king in the foreground with his arm out, the hand facing towards us, that bit of foreshortening reminds me so much of the figure of Joseph in our painting. Yes, now I can see that. And Veronese is Venetian, but if we're looking at old masters in what, the latter part of the 16th century then, you know, they were working in Florence, in, in Rome, in Milan. 
you know, how do we begin to narrow it down? Well, we have to look at the, 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 the different styles and footprints of the artists of this period. And one thing I think that's going to really help us is colour when this picture is cleaned. I mean, this painting is all about light and colour. It sort of defines the action. I mean, it looks like they've plundered the dressing up box, doesn't it, really? I think that's going to lead us in a useful direction. Encouraged by our visit to the National Gallery, we're meeting up with our specialist art researcher, Dr. Bendor Grosvenor. So, we've got a double mystery on our hands then. Who painted this picture and how did it get to the church? But I thought the obvious place to start was with the Church of England, because after all, this painting is in one of their buildings. They wrote back to me. They think they have about 100 works by well-known artists in their churches around the country, possibly 12,000 or more artworks by lesser known or unknown artists, but they don't have a central register. They ended their letter by saying, there will be hidden gems. So that's an intriguing thought for any future investigations. But as far as this painting goes, hit a brick wall there. In terms of how the picture got to the church, I was following up the congregation's idea that the picture was connected to a local squire called Richard Tillman North. And rather helpfully, he does in fact have some descendants who still live in the area. So they may have some paperwork or some archives that we could look at. Yeah, I definitely want to talk to them. All right, well, while you're doing that, I'll look into Richard Tillman North a bit more. If he comes up as a known art collector, then that's great news. And then, of course, there's the question of who painted this picture. I mean, OK, I saw it up a ladder with a torch, but I reckon it's 16th century, and I reckon it's Italian. So the question is, where in Italy? Because every part of Italy has its own style, its own character of painting. Is it from the Veneto, with Venice at its centre, it's going to be different to Florence or Siena or Rome? And then, having nailed the area, can we find the artist? Because if we can, we can really elevate this painting. As a work by an unknown painter now, is it, is it very valuable? Well, it's a difficult subject. And as an anonymous painter from the 16th century, I mean, it may be worth 15, 20,000 pounds, but put a name to it and it could be, I don't know, 100,000, possibly more. But before we get anywhere on a name, we've got to get a better look at the painting. We need to see it under strong lights. I've arranged for the painting to be moved to the Hamilton Carr Institute, part of Cambridge University, to begin some scientific tests to help us solve this mystery. It's run by Rupert Featherstone, who has a great deal of experience in the conservation of 16th century old masters. Can he help me pinpoint exactly where in Italy our painting might have come from? This strikes you as, as a standard dirty picture, does it? Yeah. I mean, it looks like it's a varnish of some, what, 100, 150 years? I don't know. It hasn't actually sort of kept the saturation, so that's why all these areas look so sort of foggy. It's very clear now that it's in three pieces. Mm, yes. They're very straight. They don't look like tears, but they could be cuts, but they're more likely to be seams, but then mm. it's a bit odd, frankly, to have a seam right through the head of Christ. The first thing Rupert wants to do is to swab a few areas with white spirit to get an idea of the true colours that lie beneath. Can we home in on a country of origin? If we start with this area, it, mm. it really does bring out the depth in the shadows and the, the colour intensifies, but you see the modelling, you see the way the face is constructed. Yes, right? you see, that's exciting. That, mm. sh that shows a subtlety combined with a boldness in the colouring, which mm. I think is going gonna, is gonna to help us identify where this painting was painted. I think we could try another area yeah. because there are some beautiful colours, I suspect, hidden under this layers of dirt and varnish. I mean, the... The Virgin's the, Robe? The Virgin's Robe is an interesting one. We, we're hoping that this would be blue, but at the moment it still looks fairly green, even as you wet it out. There's a, a, an underpainting, but of solid, thick, white strokes, which are then covered with a translucent glaze, which is a recognised technique of the, of the sort of 16th, 17th centuries, and it's, it's, it's just what you'd hope to see. Yes, it's, it's, it's one colour shining through another in a rather sort of bewitchingly bold way, mm. which, which takes one to sort of northern Italy, doesn't it? Quite possibly. I mean, it, it feels right for, a, for an Italian painting, certainly. So, northern Italy, this is exciting. And as Rupert continues to clean, clues are revealed which make me suspect a particular city as well. 
What we can already now begin to see with some of the shapes that are now revealed, you know, the expression on the Virgin's face, the colours and the tones, these are all like indicating certainly a place, and that place has to be. The more I look, the more I feel that colour has to be Venice. I would agree. I would agree, totally. The emergence of colour is a vital clue and reminds me of the Veronese we saw at the National Gallery, a distinctly Venetian painting which, just like ours, depicts a dramatic religious scene. I'm thrilled. I'm confident I now know where this picture was painted. The next thing we need to do is to carry out infrared and X-ray tests. When we get the results, it might even take us closer to the identity of the artist. Meanwhile, I'm investigating how our painting came to be in the church. I'm heading back to Lancashire. The congregation believe it once hung in Thurland Castle, not far from Tunstall, and the family seat of Richard Toulmin North. I've tracked down one of his descendants, Lady Sue Kimber, who still lives nearby and has an archive of family records. Hello. hello. Nice to meet you. Lovely to meet you. Can I find any proof here that Toulmin North ever owned the picture? So this is your family tree. Is it beautifully done? Look at it this. It is lovely, isn't it? With the family shield. Yes. So we've got Richard... Toulmin North here. So born January the 17th, 1782, died unmarried July the 14th, 1865. This is a wonderful family record. Do you have many other family documents? Well, an awful lot. I'm afraid got burnt in 1879 in fire and certainly a serious number of pictures went up. How disappointing. This fire in 1879 probably destroyed evidence which could have linked Toulmin North to our painting. These cuttings here, they're about, about the fire, are they? They are. Yes, I can yes. see here, fire at Thurland see. Castle. On Wednesday morning at an early hour, Thurland Castle near Kirby Lonsdale was found to be in flames. Three times an attempt was made to rescue some of the pictures in the dining room, but the flames drove them back. It's so frustrating, isn't it? Because if it hadn't been for the fire, we'd have a wonderful record, I imagine. I know, I imagine. You know, judging by right. this. It's, it's very disappointing. I mean, do you know if the family were great collectors of art, were interested in art? Well, the only record I have of that is uh, the fact that we've got paintings of Thurlan Castle, which is, shows a lot of pictures. I suspect... This painting here? This painting. Let's try and get it up. Whoa. And have a look at it. There we go. I know that was meant to be a rather good Italian picture. That was sold, so that must have survived the fire. Do you have the documentation for where that was sold? No. Oh. <laughs> you tell me get close and then just... It's so annoying, isn't it? I know. Our painting's not there, is it? I'm I'll afraid quick... not, no. Do you have the wills of the family? Because it might detail the painting or, or else be show the bequest of the painting to the church. Well, very sadly not. No, I fear they must have all been destroyed in the fire. The fire. So, That's really put the kibosh on things, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I'm afraid so. <laughs> well, that was very interesting. In terms of tracing the provenance of our painting, there's no doubt the fire at Thurland Castle has made things a lot trickier. But on the positive side, we've now got a real idea of a family, the, the North family, who were great collectors of paintings uh, and patrons of artists as well. So it's not completely outside the realms of possibility that they would have collected a 16th century Italian painting. Not at all. That seems a distinct possibility now. What I'd like to find out is, is how active they were on the art market. Were they buying? Were they selling? Maybe Bendor can look into that. While Fiona has been getting to know the North family, I've been called back to the Hamilton Carr Institute to get the results of the X-rays and infrared tests. I'm hoping they will shed some light on how our artist set about painting the picture. I'm excited to see what Rupert has discovered, so I've asked church warden Jane Greenhalge to meet me here. Using infrared to take a, basically a photograph or a scan, it, it's something that cuts through into the paint. So it's rather a nice way of, firstly, picking up the whole painting, where the changes might be. For example, there's a tree. Huh. 
right behind Joseph. Which, which we frankly couldn't see. No, mm -hmm. but it's very clearly been painted out. I'm sure that was done by the artist. I don't think that's something that was later retouched. And you can see why I might have done it, because there is something slightly ungainly about a tree trunk coming out of the back of, there of, is. of Joseph's head. What does X-ray, which takes us deeper, tell us? The X-ray will show us in more detail if there's changes, but it only picks up on certain pigments, particularly lead ones. Can we have a look? Yeah, certainly. Well, in this case, what we see, and it's a bit difficult to read because it's only a little detail, so I have to sort of hold it up, but this piece here, this shape here, is what we see here, the Virgin's headpiece. And then you see this shape, which is very strong in X-ray, it's dense paint, it's up here somewhere, we can't see it at all. And actually what's happened is that the whole head of the Virgin started off up there and got moved down here. That's an artist's change, a deliberate alteration of the composition. Mm. Mm. And interestingly, it, it, it changes the, the focus of the picture because it was an image of a mother looking, gazing into the face of her dead child. It's now one more in which she's reflecting upon the corpse. It's more loving, it's yes. more caring, I should imagine, where it is now than when... It's more intimate, possibly. Much more intimate mm. than it possibly was before. Yes, it's allowing you to reflect on her grief. Yes. There's a lot of thought in it. Yes. A tremendous amount, which, which makes it quite a spiritual um, painting. I'm excited to, that we, we're beginning to understand it. These tests have confirmed to me that our artist was a very skilled painter, but can we go further and prove that he was an eminent old master? While Philip tracks down our artist, Bendor is picking up the trail of Richard Toulmin North. With the fire at Thurland Castle destroying much of the family archive and his military records failing to confirm where he served, can Bendor find any evidence that links him to the painting? So I'm gonna have a general rummage around, try and find out what we can see about Thurland Castle uh, the Toulmin Norths, whether they were collectors. See what we can find. There's something here about Thurland Castle, which was written in 1849. Oh, it's a guidebook, concise description of the English lakes by Jonathan Otley. And this is very nice. He talks about a trip to the church a quarter of a mile from the village of Tunstall stands a church in plain Middle Gothic style. The interior has lately been restored and with a painting over the communion table of the descent from the cross by an ancient master. So Bendor has found solid provenance that our painting has been in Tunstall Church for over 150 years, just as the congregation told us. But is there any evidence to support their suspicion that it was given to the church by Richard Toulmin North? Bendor consults a handy art world resource, the Getty Provenance Index, which lists the sale of every painting from Sotheby's and Christie's since the 1700s. Is there any record of a Toulmin North buying any paintings? No, I can't find any evidence at all that Richard Toulmin North was actively collecting at auction in our time frame. Maybe Toulmin North isn't our man after all. It seems we're going to have to dig deeper to uncover how our picture got to Tunstall. And as for who painted our picture, I'm convinced there are more clues lurking beneath its dirty surface. So I think we need to begin an ambitious project to restore our picture. I've asked specialist conservator Simon Gillespie to take on this challenge at his London studio. It's been to Lancashire, it's then been to Cambridge, and now it's made its way to you. How do you feel with four square metres of dirty canvas like this in front of you? At the moment, it's very dull because of age. The old varnishes have just deteriorated. That's the dullness. There's also years and years of dirt on there. Is there added later paints to this in evidence? Yes, there is. Certainly you can see it very obviously along the, the lines of the joins of the original canvas. This artist put three pieces of canvas together and that has failed in the past and has been repaired. This explains the unsightly seam. To make a large picture, the artist sewed three separate pieces of canvas together and some of the stitching goes through a key part of the painting. 
The only passage I, I'm slightly nervous about is where the, 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 the joins in the old canvas go straight through Christ's head, which unfortunately actually goes straight through his eye. Which was well. the last piece you want to tear, isn't it? Yeah. And if you had to speculate what made it so dirty, what would you say it was? Well, let's start at the top. Number one, these little white things all over it. They've yeah. obviously had bats or <laughs> swallows or something in the church. And then you've got just from neglect, because lots of people tell their cleaners, don't touch the paintings. But of course, the one thing they don't do is actually take off the dust and the dirt. And the, at the, Christmas carols, you know, when we're all singing and blaring away with our mince pies in us, um, th there's a lot of humid humidity and, and so yeah. the pollution of the faithful. Pollution of the faithful. Yeah. Yes. I can't wait to see what lies beneath this picture and what clues will be revealed by the cleaning process. And Fiona has made a surprising discovery about Richard Toulmin North. I've done some digging into Richard Toulmin North and put together a potted biography for you. He was born in 1782, and between 1800 and 1820, he was patron of Tunstall Church. That was simply because he owned the land that the church was on. Now, this is where I found something very unexpected, and it gets very interesting indeed. He was declared insane in 1847. Now, that date in 1847, I found some information about it in a newspaper cutting from the time. The newspaper article listed the, the evidence against Toulmin North to show that he was mad. So, for example, he would pour bottles of champagne down the throats of his soldiers. He gave lavish parties. I think the final straw that he was found shacked up in a, in a castle in Germany with a discharged stable boy. That's very interesting because he doesn't sound like the sort of person who would buy a rather intense religious painting. No, he certainly no. doesn't. He was a sort of wild boy and party man, wasn't he? Mm. But I don't want to give up on that idea just yet that he was the guy who gave the picture to the church. So I think we need to look at Richard Toulmin North's will to see if we find any mention in there of him bequeathing this picture to the church. As for our artists, I'm convinced more than ever that it's a Venetian. Do you remember that Paolo Veronese we saw in the National Gallery? Think of the similarities to our picture there. But there are also other great figures at work in Venice in the 16th century who I think can be seen to be influencing our painter. Look at this, it's by Tintoretto. And just look at the way the figures express themselves, almost as if they've been caught in frozen drama, a, a still from a film, perhaps. That's so Venice, you know, the idea of, of, of using art to express a sort of a, a, a moment of, of passion and of action. These are characteristics that I think we can see in our painting. And another great figure of the period, and again, so typical of the Venice look, and this is Titian. And look at his colours. Now, I know we haven't cleaned our picture yet, but we've got a glimpse, we've got an idea, and I think this gives us a little taste of what's to come. It all seems to point to Venice. And these artists had studios. They had assistants who worked with them. And it's possible that our artist could be one of those people who's working under the influence of one of these great giants of Venetian art. Now, the only way we're going to find out more is to go to Venice, where we could find the information that could progress our argument. It's going to be someone, a satellite figure is my guess, in their circle. We've arrived in Venice, La Serenissima. There are archives, churches and paintings here which could unlock the identity of our artist. We're taking to the water, because Philip has a theory that the artist who painted our picture drew inspiration from the city itself. When the solvent was biting through the, that filthy yellow varnish and that colour emerged from beneath, I remember thinking, you know, this is Venice. If you look at paintings from various parts of Europe, they have their characteristics, but none is as distinctive and as all-consuming as, as Venetian colour. And what's on that canvas is around us now. And Venice would have been such a melting pot of cultures, of, of the East and the West. I mean, during the Renaissance, there was nowhere like Venice in the world for that, that mixture of influences and cultures. So if our painting is from Venice, it has to be uniquely the product of a Venetian mind. So who was our artist inspired by this floating city?
I'm meeting Dr. Philip Rylands, director of the Guggenheim Museum, who's been studying our picture, and he thinks he's got some information that can help us. He wants to show me a painting by the old master Titian, which depicts the same story as our picture. Can he help me decode this scene to understand what our artist was trying to achieve? Now, Philip, this has real resonances with our painting. Well, the painting is of the same subject. The Pietà is a theme in, in Italian painting and sculpture, and it describes really the event that's taking place here, the Virgin Mary's sadness at the death of her son, Jesus Christ. So it's the deepest and the saddest moment yes. in the New Testament. I mean, it's almost, it's, it's worse than the crucifixion in terms of, of, of just angst and grief. It's the mother encountering her son. In, in that way, it's more, it touches you more humanly. Uh, every mother is going to identify with the loss of her son. Anything which reveals for worshippers the sacrifice that Christ made, according to Christian religion, uh, on the cross, the sacrifice that God made of his son in order to save man. It's a kind of central tenet of, of Christian beliefs. So it's a, it's a didactic it, it, piece. It was a sort of shot in the arm to get people to think God more. Yes. This reveals to me that our picture from Tunstall was continuing an important tradition in Venetian art. Our artist would have surely taken inspiration from this scene. But does Philip Rylands think our man was taking his cue directly from the great Titian? You've had a look at our picture. Yes. Have you got any thoughts? From what I've seen of the painting we're talking about, the much more athletic positions of the figures are uh, characteristic of Tintoretto. So it's closer to Tintoretto than it is to Titian. But that would be normal in the late 16th century. So it's someone who has seen or is aware of this type of art, who's carrying the baton down, whose style is changing, but he's still in Venice, and he's someone who could have painted it in a church around where we're standing now. Yes. This is encouraging. Philip Rylands believes our picture was painted in the latter part of the 16th century and that our artist could have come from the school of Tintoretto. This will help sharpen the focus of our quest. Back in the UK, Ben Dor is still trying to find evidence that can connect Richard Toulmin North to our painting. After a number of years in a lunatic asylum, Toulmin North died in 1865. Bendor's managed to track down a copy of his will. Is there any reference to our picture here? It's dated 1865, the year he died. And because the congregation at Tunstall think that their picture might have been given to the church by their patron, Richard Tormin North, I would expect to see that fact recorded in his will. So let's have a look, see what we've got. This is the last will and testament. Well, there's lots of stuff here about estates and dividends, but nothing about any pictures, unfortunately. Now, normally what one does in this kind of situation is go back in time to see if an earlier generation might have bequeathed the picture. So what I've also got here is the will of Richard Tormin North's father, who was called Miles North, and that is dated 1784. So let's have a look. Dividends. Livestock. There's no mention of our painting in the will of Miles North either, but there is something rather surprising. Miles North gives to Elizabeth Needham of Dublin and Frederick Richard Needham the enormous sum of 100 guineas a year in annuity. Now that's, that's enough that you wouldn't have to work again. So why is he giving these people this money? There's no suggestion here that they're relatives and it may be just the 21st century mind, but my assumption is that she may have been his mistress and that this Frederick Richard Needham could have been his illegitimate son. I think these names are worthy of further investigation. With no evidence connecting Richard Toulmin North to the painting, could Frederick Needham offer a new line of inquiry? Back in Venice, Fiona and I are looking for clues to identify our artist. I want to follow up the lead from Philip Rylands, that our man came from the school of Tintoretto. I'm also curious to see the type of place our painting would have been displayed. So we're on our way to San Giorgio Maggiore, an island church where there is a painting by Tintoretto and his son. 
This is the Stoning of St. Stephen, which, just like our painting, depicts a dramatic and emotive scene from the New Testament. You see, I think this is far closer to how our picture would have been experienced. I mean, we're in a side chapel. It's rather more intimate. And you can imagine it up there in front of us, you know, this, this image of grief communicating itself very personally to someone sitting where we are. This is by Tintoretto and his son and studio, which certainly when it comes to the attribution of our painting just shows how complicated it, it may be. It's a whole family business. So trying to pinpoint exactly who painted any painting in Venice, but in particular our painting, is a lot more complicated, isn't it? And I always think trying to tell one artist from another working in Venice is a bit like trying to work out one part of a flock from another. I mean, they're all the same species, but they all vary slightly. And there's something about the colour, that warm hue that shines through, but we've still got the other bright colours, something to do with the contrasts of the light and the dark, something to do with the way the figures are leaning forward in that quite extreme way, lurching. Dare I say it? I feel we're getting just that little bit warmer, that little bit closer to who might have done ours. Everything seems to point towards our artist coming from Venice and from the school of Tintoretto. I'm going to stay here, continue my research, and see what else I can unearth. And I've returned to London where the ambitious operation to clean our painting has begun. I'm really hoping that this process will uncover some vital evidence for the investigation. What's exciting is this is the oldest painting that we've ever dealt with on Fake or Fortune. What's frustrating is that the paperwork has thrown up so little. Therefore, what's going on behind me now is absolutely crucial. It could hold the key to the identity of the artist. They are using a sophisticated variant of the normal cleaning method. A special formula of gel is made up and applied to the canvas. It absorbs the dirt and varnish, but leaves the paint untouched. A team of four specialists will spend over six weeks restoring the picture. Will this reveal an artist connected to the old master, Tintoretto? While Philip's overseeing the restoration of our painting, I want to know why it may have left Venice and ended up in Tunstall. A painting like ours was almost certainly intended to hang in a church. And I found out that churches in Venice were a valuable source of cash to the invading armies of Napoleon as he waged war across Europe at the end of the 18th century. When he conquered Venice, he seized thousands of works of art from the churches. Did he take ours? I'm meeting Dr. Nora Geetz at the Venetian State Archives, who's been compiling a list of the paintings appropriated by Napoleon. You've got this fascinating array of documents here. What does this tell us about that period? So Venice, before Napoleon came in, had uh, 70 parishes, and Napoleon reduces this to 30 parishes only. And so here, what, what he's listing is, is the parishes, their subsidiary churches, exactly. and other churches and oratories. I mean, it's fantastically detailed. And here, interestingly, it talks about those that are particularly conspicuous or commendable for their architecture and paintings. What do any of these documents show us about what paintings Napoleon selected and, and where he put them? So he hired this man called Pietro Edwards to go through these paintings. Here, I chose a document to show you. He basically would go into each building that has been closed down inventorize the paintings and then organize the paintings to be transported into various deposits. So how many paintings are we talking about in this document here? Well here for example you see that um, there's a total of 12,791 paintings that this man catalogued. Fascinating, he catalogues them by their quality as well. So you've got pitture poste, so pictures in third and even in fourth class. Exactly, so he then had to make a selection which of these 12,791 paintings 
were the best ones and decided to keep only a total of 1,279 paintings. And what would happen to those and where would they They would end go up? into galleries like the Brera galleries in Milan, which was his capital in Italy, or the Academia here in Venice. And the very best ones would go into the Louvre in Paris. These paintings taken by Napoleon were listed as the greatest in Venice. They're clearly categorized, and none of the descriptions match our painting. Maybe ours was a second, third, or fourth class of painting. What happened to those pictures? Obviously, they were trying to sell these paintings, so they would organize auctions with uh, very little um, success, unfortunately, but also try and sell paintings in private transactions to raise money for the empire. And there was very little success in the auctions because, well, presumably the art market was saturated. If he was selling, if you're trying to get rid of this many paintings. It was. It's very likely this is how our painting was removed from a Venetian church and eventually ended up in Tunstall. Our picture could have been one of the thousands of paintings which left Venice after Napoleon invaded. We just need to find evidence that the North family could have bought the painting around this time. Back in the UK, Bendor has confirmed an intriguing connection between Richard Toulmin North and Frederick Needham. There's an article in the Times here from long ago discussing a legal dispute that Richard Tormund North was involved in. And it suddenly says that a Mr. Needham was the natural son of Mr. North's father, and therefore the half-brother of Mr. North. So the Mr. North's father is Miles North, and Richard Tormund North is therefore the half-brother of this Frederick Needham chap. Bendor has also discovered that Frederick Needham has a close connection with Tunstall Church. And looking into the church records from the time, we suddenly see Frederick Needham's name pop up as the vicar of Tunstall. He's vicar from 1800 until 1816 when he dies. So that's extraordinary. What we have here is a religiously minded man with a family connection to the Toulmin Norths and who probably had enough money to be buying pictures. So the next step that goes off in my mind is to check my handy Getty database to see if someone called Needham was buying pictures at the right time. The Getty database should list any painting that Needham bought at a major auction house. I like the look of this. Uh, a picture sold in 1812 in Dublin. Uh, it's a religious scene. It's by Jacopo Bassano, another Venetian painter from the 16th century. The buyer's name says Needham. It doesn't say Frederick Needham, but it says a Needham of Dublin. So therefore, it would appear to be the right date of sale, the right subject matter, similar name. Although this picture can't be ours, as it depicts a very different religious scene, it makes Needham a more likely buyer of our painting. I mean, it's not a dead cert, but everybody at Tunstall thinks that Richard Toulmin North gave them the painting because he gave them the stained glass. But what if it was his brother, the illegitimate half-brother, the vicar, who actually gave him the painting. This is a real breakthrough. Frederick Needham had money from his father's will. He had a strong connection to the church and the North family and was buying old master paintings from Venice. So, in all likelihood, it was Needham who gave the painting to the church. It all adds up to being the most likely explanation for how our painting arrived in Tunstall. And back in Venice, I might have a lead on who painted our picture. After weeks of searching, I've at last tracked down someone who believes they may know the identity of our mystery artist. I'm meeting Enrico Dal Pozzolo, a highly regarded Italian art scholar at the Doge's Palace, the seat of power in Renaissance Venice, and as such, adorned with the finest 16th century Venetian paintings. Could this be the moment our elusive artist is finally unmasked? Allora, lei, signora, pensa che ha un'idea chi è l'artista di nostra pittura? E il suo lavoro si trova in questa sala? Sì, penso di sapere che potrebbe essere l'autore esattamente di quel quadro sopra le nostre teste. Di questo qua? Sì. 
Enrico thinks he can see past the dirt and grime of our painting and believes the same artist is responsible for this gloriously colourful picture on the ceiling of the Doge's palace. He's also spotted similarities in other paintings by the same artist. Esistono delle pitture che hanno un'impostazione molto simile, come ad esempio questo che si trova a Berlino. Enrico points to the way Christ's arm falls, the same way in both pictures. And the face of the Virgin Mary. They certainly seem to bear a remarkable similarity to our painting. E il nome dell'artista è? Francesco Montemezzano. 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 So is this our man? Francesco Montemezzano, who did work with Tintoretto, but is more closely associated with Paolo Veronese, the artist whose work Philip and I saw at the National Gallery in London. This could be a massive breakthrough, but how certain is Enrico? Posso dire che la mia convinzione, non la mia sicurezza, è che possa essere un'opera di Montemezzano, 99%. 99%? È quasi sicura allora? Quasi. Il quasi è molto importante però nella storia dell'arte. I wasn't sure we'd ever get to this point, putting an actual name to our painting. But one of Italy's top scholars is convinced Monte Mezzano is our artist. He worked in the right period in Venice, was a contemporary of Tintoretto, and had close ties to Veronese. I can't wait to get back to the UK and break the news to Philip and Bendor. Well, I must say, I think we've had a real breakthrough. Meeting that Italian scholar in Venice, Enrico del Pozzolo, and coming up with that name, as if from thin air, Francesco Montemezzano. I must confess, I've never heard of before. Well, neither have we. But it's really substantive progress. We have now got an artist that we can play with. And I have been. I've been looking at other works by Montemezzano. And I have to say, I think the argument is looking really convincing. Here is our picture and the other two paintings that I'm referring to. Now look at the figure of the dead Christ. Look how the light falls upon the body. It's in a very similar way, and particularly those loose arms. But there's another. Have a look at the face of the Virgin Mary. And I am pretty well convinced that this is the same face as the Virgin Mary in these two other compositions by Montemezzano. So we could be dealing with an artist who is just using, as artists do, the same model. Well, I've been looking into the life of uh, Francesco Montemezzano, and it turns out it was at least as colourful as his paintings. There's not an awful lot said about him, but I've tracked down some information about him in a, in a rather obscure biography of Venetian artists from 1648 by a chap called Ridolfi, and it tells us how Montemezzano was born in about 1540. He painted with Paolo Veronese, which might explain some of those sort of similar characteristics. My favourite bit is at the end of this biography. It talks here about Francesco a piaceri amorosi. Francesco Montemezzano had many, many love affairs, and he also had a great love of expensive things. And his life ended in a poisoning. Whether he was poisoned by, I don't know, a jealous husband, jilted lover, in these many love affairs, who's to say? But he was certainly quite a character. Hmm. It reminds me in that aspect about uh, Richard Toulmin North, who actually, I think, was now a bit of a red herring when it comes to who gave our painting to the church. I'm pretty convinced instead that it was his illegitimate half-brother, Frederick Needham. Well, this is all really encouraging. It seems that we've managed to solve at least half the mystery. But what about the artist? Now, Enrico's thesis is very convincing, but in order to convince the British art market, the people who buy these pictures over here, we need to go to the leading authority on this area of history of art. And before we do that, we have to make sure that the painting is cleaned as best it can be, because with any luck, it will do the work for us. We've invited churchwarden Jane to the studio to see the results of the restoration and reveal who the artist may be. Okay, Jane, here it is. Shall we do the grand unveiling? Wonderful. Okay, are you ready? Hang on. Ta da! Oh, wow! The painting has emerged like a butterfly from a chrysalis, where there was dirt and grime are now jewel like colours, just what you'd hope to see in an old master painting from Venice. Oh, isn't it beautiful? Absolutely wonderful. 
Oh, there's a, a bit of the tree up there. Yeah, the tentament, yes. the, the artist's first idea. Yes. I mean, in, in, in art world terms, this has been more than just a clean. It, it's been little short of a resurrection. <laughs> I mean, what, what was hidden can now be seen. And what we've left is a little dark patch. Can you see on the Virgin Mary's uh, drapes there? Yes. That black oh, square. Yes, yes, yes. So wow. that's how dirty it was. Gosh. The comparison couldn't be more startling. Details once hidden are now revealed. And the restoration has even managed to repair the stitching through Christ's eye. So we have been to Venice. Yes. And while we were there, I spoke to an Italian, a well-known Italian mm -hmm. scholar. The name he came up with was a man called Francesco Montemezzano. Oh, right. Well, it's not one of the greats. No. Not, we're not no, talking no, Veronese, no. No. Titian, Tintoretto, no. but possibly Francesco Montemezzano. Right. And if we can turn it into a Francesco Montemezzano, a canvas that would be worth 15, 20,000 pounds as an anonymous work, it could be worth 100,000 pounds. Wow. I, now, I am surprised because I didn't think it would be as much as that. So that's an, oh gosh. And I have to say that although that's wonderful news, we want the picture in the church and we don't want to sell it, but it's amazing that that could be that value. But, it, but it's just a beautiful painting. Absolutely delighted. I mean, the picture looks magnificent now that it's cleaned. It's a different picture. And I just hope that this can be verified. Now it's time for the verdict. This will determine the true value of our painting. We've invited Enrico Dal Pozzolo, who Fiona met in Venice, to examine the painting in person. But to get the art market to accept it as a genuine Montemezzano will also need the endorsement of Professor Peter Humphrey, a recognised authority on this period of Italian art. De la, de la, de la mm -hmm. There's a lot riding on this. If we can't give it a firm attribution, in a tough market for Italian works, it's worth probably 15, 20,000 pounds. However, if we can add that name Montemezzano, it transforms it. It's that name that we need. Normally on Fake or Fortune, we deal with artists that are household names. So this is an unusual situation for us. Francesco Montemezzano, an artist most people have never heard of, and certainly neither Philip nor I had heard of before we went to Venice. And then suddenly, his name was pulled out like a rabbit from a hat. But putting that name to the painting today will be crucial. And now is the moment we're going to find out. Gentlemen, hello. Enrico, nice to see you again. This is the first time you've seen the painting. And of course, now it's been cleaned as well. Are you still of the opinion, as you told me originally in Venice, that this is a work by Francesco Montemezzano? Sì, penso che sia proprio un'opera della mano di Francesco Montemezzano, soprattutto dopo il restauro. So you definitely think it's by him? Yes. Especially now after the restoration. Sì. Well, that is great news. That sounds like a rounding endorsement. Thank you. Peter, now I know how much significance the art world attaches to your opinions, whether you like it or not. I'm afraid we do. Uh, what are your thoughts about this picture? Seeing this even in poor reproduction to start with, I could see that it was related to the work of Paolo Veronese. The figure of the Mary Magdalene, for example, could almost be taken from one of his pictures, but you can see that it's not Veronese, it's by somebody uh, related to him. And so I actually thought of Montemezzano and was very pleased to hear, you know, Enrico came up with this uh, spontaneously. And, uh, and I quite agree, I quite agree. I think it's oh, got to be Montemezzano. Yes. Oh, wonderful. We have a name, <laughs> Francesca Montemezzano. Oh. Beauty of a name. It's official. Our painting is by Francesco Montemezzano, making it worth in excess of 100,000 pounds. The moment has come to return it to the church at Tunstall and reveal what we believe is the true story of their painting. We've arranged for it to be reinstated in its original position on the wall. And waiting for us are Jane, Vicar Mark Cannon, 
and Lady Sue Kimber from the North family. Bit of a change, eh? Wow. Gosh. Well, that is fantastic. <laughs> well, we didn't know what it was, and now we've got this light and glowing devotional piece. There aren't many large-scale restoration projects quite as revelationary as this that I've been involved with. And two things have emerged. The first is that the picture now is performing as it should do. It's telling a story in a church. And secondly, as a result of all of this restoration, we can look into the painting and we can be certain about who painted it. And it's by an artist called Francesco Montemezzano, working in late 16th century Venice. But it's not just the, the painting we now know a little bit more about, is it? Richard Toulmin North, who you believe was how this painting got here, that seems less likely now. OK. okay. Richard Toulmin North is a bit of a red herring. Right. But he did lead us to his half-brother, Frederick Needham, a name you will know because, of course, he's written up here as a vicar of this church. Mm -hmm. And Frederick Needham was left a substantial a stipend by his father. And what did he spend it on? Venetian art. No. Oh, really? Right. No. Italian art. And therefore, it seems the most likely that Frederick Needham, with his love of Italian art, brought this painting to his church. I mean, it's not, it's not everybody's subject matter, clearly, because religious painting isn't, but it's worth, it's worth 100,000 or more. Good. Gulp. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll sell it. We'll no, sell we it. won't. <laughs> At last, we can reintroduce the painting to the entire congregation. It's Francesco Monte Mezzano. Have I got it right? <laughs> This started out as an ecclesiastical whodunit. Who created the painting and who brought it here? And we've cracked it. Francesco Montemezzano, late 16th century painter from Venice, and Frederick Needham, the vicar of Tunstall. Two names until now I don't think you'd ever have put together in the same sentence. Of course, it's not all about big names, is it? I mean, who, who really knew about this artist much before this? And we've plucked him from obscurity. And of course it makes one think, you know, scratch the surface, go beneath the dirt, use what knowledge you can. How many more out there are just waiting to be discovered? If you think you have an undiscovered masterpiece, we'd love to hear from you at bbc.co.uk slash fake or fortune. And the final Fake or Fortune is here at the same time next week. Next tonight on BBC One, Lewis is out of prison, but for how long? It's the unmissable concluding part of The Outcast in a couple of minutes. And just started on BBC Four, Beethoven's Symphony No. 9 is among the key picks from this year's BBC Proms with Sunday Symphony.